In this video, we're going to talk about consumers, producers, and the efficiency of markets. So what we're going to be thinking about is developing a, a measure of the well-being of consumers and a measure of the well-being of producers. And then we're going to think about what a free market results in in terms of, of human well-being. So we're going to essentially, one of the main goals of this chapter is to think about whether or not free markets are good okay, in terms of, of human well-being. Now, let's start by thinking about what we mean by the term free market. And so if um, you've been watching previous videos, there's probably a, a time or two where I've talked about this in a previous video. But let's just review what we mean when we talk about a free market. And, and this is something that I didn't realize until you know, I had been teaching for a little while. Economists use the word free market and sometimes forget that out there in the non-economist world, other people use that term a little bit or that phrase a little bit differently. So when I use the word free market, I do not mean a market or a situation where the sellers are free to do anything they want. Um, one time I was having a uh, discussion with my daughter and it was about whether or not markets were good. And I said, well, we can demonstrate that free markets um, are a good thing. They're not perfect and we'll talk about that. But all other things equal, I would much rather have a free market than some, some planned system. And she said, well, we learned in school that free markets are not good. And I was kind of shocked. I, I just can't imagine that, that people are being taught that. But in the course of this conversation, it turns out that what she would, meant when she said free market was a situation where the sellers could do anything they wanted. They could lie to the consumers and they could um, dump waste into rivers and they could do all kinds of stuff. It, it was just like a, a, a market with no rules is how she was using the term. If that's how you use the term, then you need to keep in mind that's not how I'm using the term. So when I talk about a free market, what I'm talking about is a situation where buyers and sellers are free to, engage, to um, uh, make decisions that they want engage in exchange between each other if they want, but everything has to happen within the bounds of the law. So ideally, we would want the consumers and the producers to have the same information um, so that the, the producers can't lie to the, the uh, buyers about the quality of the product or anything like that. So our free market is going to be a free market within the bounds of the law. People's property rights are protected, um, et cetera. So, what we need to do is we need to come up with a measure of the economic well-being of buyers and sellers. And um, so the best way to describe how we get to what we're going to use, which is we're going to call consumer surplus and producer surplus, the best way to explain that is to first talk a little bit about Jeremy Bentham, an early economist. Um, what happened was that Bentham was looking for a way of measuring the well-being of people. And Bentham's idea was, Bentham was around when the thermometer was invented. And prior to the invention of the thermometer, it was easy to hold two objects and say, well, this one feels warmer than that one, but we weren't able to put an objective number on it. And then the thermometer gets invented, and now all of a sudden we can measure the temperature of something in terms of degrees, and we can say, well, that, this item is five degrees warmer than that item. And Jeremy Bentham wanted to do a similar thing with utility, what he was going to call utility. He wanted to do it with, with human well-being. And he envisioned a point in time where a device would be invented, he was going to call it a utilometer, and that device would be able to measure the, the happiness or the well-being that a person experiences. So maybe it was some device that you put under your tongue and, and the units of measure for the utilometer were going to be utils. And so he would be able to measure your happiness in terms of utils or your satisfaction in terms of utils. Turns out that never happened, right? And so, and Jeremy Bentham knew that it didn't, wasn't going to happen. And, but that was kind of the basis of, of some of the stuff that we still use today, that we still think about the utility maximization model. 
Not in this class, but in a, a different class you might look at that. So Jeremy Bentham came up with this idea of measuring the well-being of people in terms of utility. We can't objectively measure utility, but we can objectively measure something else. Now, it turns out there's an interesting um, other story about Jeremy Bentham. He became wealthy. He left um, his fortune to one of the economic schools in London. I can never remember which one it is, but he left them um, a, a good chunk of his fortune with the provision that they, they preserve his body, remove the head, mount him in this display cabinet that he called the auto icon and um, put his clothes on the skeleton and put he was sitting in a on a little bench there and then his head had to be preserved and then mounted between his feet and uh, they did it uh, you can google auto icon or jeremy bentham and you will see pictures of jeremy bentham's preserved head and and his body and it's kind of a one of the more unusual um, stories in economics, but we're not going to be thinking about utility in this chapter. We're going to be thinking about something we call consumer surplus and producer surplus, and we're going to use those to measure the well-being of buyers and sellers. Then what we're going to do is we're going to th think about how a market works, and we're going to think about what that market results in in terms of the well-being of buyers and sellers, and then we can compare that to other economic systems and see whether a market system um, how a market system compares to other systems, like a, a socialist system or a, a communist system, a planned system. Okay? So, the way that we're going to do this is we first need to think about how economists measure value. And it turns out that if you consider, think about something that you value highly. And, and if you're taking notes right now, then, then uh, I want you to think about something you value highly and something you value, you place some value on, but not very much. If you're taking notes, whatever you're using to write could be the second thing, the, the thing that you value, but not very much. For the other thing, think about some physical thing that you value highly. Maybe it's something that somebody gave to you um, and, and they've passed away and, and that, that kind of for you, um, you value it because they gave it to you. For me, it's, it would be a guitar that, that my uh, grandpa gave me. And um, if I didn't have that, I, I would be disappointed. Um, I, I place a lot of value on it. So think about those two things. And then think about me taking both of them away from you. And think about which one of those you would be willing to pay the most to get back. And if you've done what I ask you to do, you'll realize real quickly you'd be willing to pay more to get the thing back that you value the most. So we can represent how much you value that by looking at how much you'd be willing to pay to get it back if I took it. Or if it bothers you to think about me taking it, we could think about me offering to buy it from you. And in that case, we'd be thinking about your willingness to accept dollars to part with it. So both of them are kind of different ways to look at a, a very similar idea, and that is how much purchasing power are you willing to exchange for this? And so we're going to be thinking about willingness to pay, and I'm going to abbreviate willingness to pay WTP, willingness to pay, WTP. So I'll write that frequently. So this is going to be our measure of value. This is how economists measure the value you place on something whatever you're willing to pay to get it. Now, let's think about an example where you have, uh, let's suppose you have a guitar and you're interested in selling that guitar and so you invite um, some people to an auction that you're going to have where you're going to auction this guitar off. And let's suppose that some bidders show up. So we have some bidders. Let's call them A, B, C and D. So these four people show up and let's suppose we think about their willingness to pay. So we're going to be thinking in this column about how much each of these four people value this guitar that you're going to be auctioning off. Let's suppose that bidder A values it at a thousand dollars. Okay, That's their willingness to pay. Bidder B values it at eight hundred dollars. Bidder C values it at six hundred and bidder D values it at 400. 
Now you, as the seller of the guitar, you don't see these numbers. All you see is that four people show up. But what's going to happen is that the auction process itself is going to reveal the willingness to pay for three of these people, and one person's going to end up buying the guitar. So if we think about how the auction would work, you would start the bidding, and let's suppose that you started at $200, and all four of these people would be bidding. Once the price rises to just above $400, D falls out. They don't want to bid anymore because they were willing to pay $400, but no more. But A, B, and C would still bid for the guitar, and so the price would continue to rise until it gets just above $600, and then bidder C would fall out. A and B would be bidding against each other, and the price would continue to rise until it's just above $800, and then bidder B would fall out. And so bidder A is going to end up buying the guitar, and they're going to pay one bidding increment higher than $800. Let's just call it, for convenience, $800. So A buys the guitar for $800. And then again, it's going to be one bidding increment above $800, but we'll keep it at $800. Now, A is going to be happy about this because they were willing to pay $1,000, but because of the way this worked out, they only had to pay $800. So they have $200 left over that they were willing to give up to get that item, but because of the way it worked, they only had to pay $800 and they get to keep that $200. We say that A gets $200 of consumer surplus. which we will abbreviate CS, consumer surplus. Let's put that in parentheses. Bidder A gets $200 of consumer surplus. Now let's think about um, a couple of things related to this. So the first thing to think about is to notice that what ended up happening is that this auction resulted in the person that valued the good the most getting it. So bidder A valued it the most, and ended up walking away with it. Bidders B, C, and D may be disappointed that they didn't end up buying it, but they didn't end up having to pay anything either. So they don't get any consumer surplus because they didn't engage in a transaction. Here's the other thing we need to keep in mind that these numbers here don't tell us anything about income necessarily. So it's tempting sometimes to think, well, bidder A, that's probably just a rich person. And as usual, the rich person walked away with it. That, that's not necessarily an inference we can make. It turns out that bidder A could be uh, some kid that really wants a, that guitar and has been saving his uh, money from mowing lawns for a long time and is willing to pay a thousand. And it could be that bidder D is somebody that's very wealthy and just doesn't particularly value the guitar um, very much. So it, even though it's tempting to think that these somehow represent income, they don't. They simply represent the value that these four people placed on it. Also notice that the auction revealed bidders D, C, and B's willingness to pay because we could see when they quit bidding. It didn't reveal the full amount that bidder A was willing to pay, it only revealed that they were willing to pay more than anybody else. They had a higher value than anybody else. Now what we want to do here is we want to draw the demand curve for the guitar. And then we want to see where this consumer surplus shows up with that demand curve. So if we think about how to, actually let's draw, before we draw it, let's put together the uh, demand schedule. So we're going to think about um, the price of the guitar, and we're going to think about quantity demanded. Now remember, there's only one guitar here, but multiple people want to buy that guitar, so the quantity demanded can certainly be higher than one. Let's think about prices above $1,000 first, and then we'll think about $1,000 to $800, and then $800 to $600, and $600 to $400, and then let's say below $400. So if we think about prices above 1,000, bidder A 
is willing to pay more than anybody else and the most they're willing to pay is a thousand. So the quantity demanded at any price above a thousand certainly is zero. Any price between a thousand and eight hundred, it's only bidder A. So quantity demanded is one. I'm going to put A here because it's just bidder A that is willing to pay any price between those two uh, points there. Between 800 and 600, quantity demanded is 2, and it's going to be A and B. They're both willing to pay a price between 800 and 600. 600 to 400, the quantity demanded is 3. It's bidders A, B, and C. And then any price below 400, quantity demanded is 4. It's all four of them, A, B, C, and D. So there's the demand schedule. Now what we need to do is we want to graph the demand curve. And so any demand curve we know is going to have price up here on the vertical axis, quantity down here. Let's, our quantities go up to four. So let's put one, two, three, four. And then let's put here our prices. So our prices um, let's put start at 200 and go up by 200 each time. So 200, um, 400, 600, 800, and 1,000. Now, what we want to do is we want to graph the information in this demand schedule on that picture. If we look at any price above 1,000, the demand curve is going to be this vertical portion of the vertical axis. Okay? Nobody wants to buy any guitars at any price above a thousand. At a price of a thousand our quantity demanded jumps to one so we get kind of a little flat segment on our demand curve. Any price between a thousand and eight hundred quantity demanded stays at one so we get a vertical segment on the demand curve. At a price of eight hundred quantity demanded jumps to two so we get another flat section on it. Any price between 800 and 600, quantity demanded is still 2. At 600, we get another jump. Quantity demanded jumps to 3. Any price between 600 and 400, it stays at 3. And then at a price of 400, it jumps out here to 4. And any price below 400, quantity demanded stays at 4. There's the demand curve for this guitar. Okay. Now let's think about what we're seeing on the demand curve here. And this is really important. This is a single demand curve that represents four people. Notice that the height of the demand curve right here is 1,000. And that corresponds to A's willingness to pay. So the height of the demand curve here represents A's willingness to pay. The height of the demand curve right here represents B's willingness to pay. Here we see C's willingness to pay. And right down here is D's willingness to pay. So here's what we're seeing. The height of a demand curve represents willingness to pay. And we can observe, especially with this demand curve, we can observe where each person's portion of the demand curve actually is. The consumers or the potential buyers with the highest willingness to pay are going to be represented up here on this end of the demand curve. The potential buyers that with the lower willingness to pay are going to be represented down here on this end of the demand curve. Now I realize that the demand curve looks like a set of steps um, and, and that's kind of weird, but keep in mind that, that it's still downward sloping. The higher the price, the smaller quantity demand it is. So that's really the most important thing that we're thinking about here. The reason the demand curve looks like a set of steps is that we've got a story here where there are discrete units of the good, right? You either buy one guitar or zero guitars. So that causes us to have these jumps from, from three to four or two to three. The other thing is that we've got a small number of buyers in the market. If we had lots of buyers, let's suppose we had um, twice as many buyers. Let's suppose we had another buyer here that was willing to pay 900 and a, another buyer that was willing to pay 700 and somebody willing to pay five and somebody willing to pay three. Then when we drew the demand curve, we'd have twice as many steps. And so you can see that as we increase the number of potential buyers in the market, 
the steps get smaller and smaller and eventually we would get a demand curve that would look kind of like what you're used to thinking about with a demand curve. So don't be bothered by the, the look of that. It looks odd, but um, it's pretty straightforward. What we want to do is we want to see where this consumer surplus shows up. Okay. Now let's think about how we calculated consumer surplus there. What we did, consumer surplus, the way we calculated it was we took bidder A's willingness to pay and we subtracted off the price that they actually did pay, which was 800. So consumer surplus is willingness to pay minus price. In our case, it was 1,000 minus 800, which gave us the consumer surplus of $200. Now, if you look at the price here, let's talk about what the, the, uh, the rest of this picture. So if we think about how this market is working, we've got one guitar that's going to be auctioned. So the supply curve for guitars is going to be vertical here at one. And so if we were to draw that in, let's draw our supply curve. If I draw the supply curve in, it's going to come right up here like that. There's my supply curve. We can see that the intersection of our demand and supply curve gives us an equilibrium quantity Q star of one. Not surprisingly, one guitar gets auctioned off. We've got this overlap in terms of price, but the way the auction works is that the price gets driven up until there are no bidders left except one, and so our price ends up stopping right here. There's P star, ends up being 800. If you look at this little rectangle right here, the vertical distance of this rectangle is 200 units, or $200, excuse me, times this horizontal distance of one. The area there is 200, which is the consumer surplus that goes to bidder A. So the area of that little rectangle there represents the consumer surplus that went to, or that's going to bidder A. So what we get is a general conclusion that the area under the demand curve and above the price tells us consumer surplus. Now what we're going to do here in a little bit is we're going to switch away from a demand curve that looks like steps and we're going to think about demand curves that are closer to what or exactly like what we're used to thinking about. But this general conclusion tells us that if we have just a plain linear demand curve like this, not steps, and we have a price that's right over here, what we've just seen is that the consumer surplus is going to be represented as the area under the demand curve and above the price. We're seeing it here with this kind of unusual demand curve, but it's also going to be true there. Okay, that's important. What's happening here is that the height of the demand curve represents willingness to pay. It represents the value. And then we subtract off what gets paid and what's left over is the consumer surplus, which is what we're seeing right there when we calculated that. Okay. Let's think about what happens if instead of just one guitar, let's suppose we had two guitars. Okay. So if we have two guitars, then our supply curve is going to shift. Now our supply curve shifts to the right. If you think back to that basic demand and supply model, you know that an increase in supply is going to drive price down and it's going to drive quantity up, and that's exactly what we're going to see. So let's suppose we have two identical guitars. Let's, let's think about it in terms of our story first. So we, if we have two guitars, and we start, and let's suppose they're identical, okay? If we start the auction price low, let's say 200, then all four people are going to be bidding on the two guitars. Once the price gets above 400, D drops out, but A, B, and C now want two, each want a guitar, but there's only two. So they're going to be bidding against each other. The price will rise to 600, just above 600, and then C drops out. And then there's no incentive for A or B to bid for one guitar or the other because they're both identical. So now there are two guitars, two people who want to buy them. So our price is going to stop at one bidding increment above 600, let's just call it 600. A and B are both going to buy a guitar for $600 each, and they're both going to get some consumer surplus. 
So with two guitars, A is going to buy one, pay a price of $600, and get $400 of consumer surplus. B will buy a guitar for $600 and get $200 of consumer surplus. Now let's see where that shows up in our picture. If we were to increase the supply to two guitars, then we're going to be dealing with a supply curve that's right here. Our equilibrium quantity, not surprisingly, is going to increase to two. So now here's our quantity. The equilibrium price is going to fall to 600. And if we look at consumer surplus now that goes to bidder A, all of this area under the demand curve, under bidder A's portion of the demand curve and above the price is going to represent consumer surplus for A. This vertical distance would be 400 times the horizontal distance of one. So if there are two guitars, price is gonna end up being 600, Consumer surplus that goes to A is going to be $400, which corresponds to this, I'm going to shade it this time, all of the area under the demand curve and above the price of $600, this area is $400. But now there's also another buyer. There's consumer surplus that goes to B, and B's consumer surplus ends up being right under their portion of the demand curve, and it's right here. This vertical distance is 200, and the horizontal distance is 1. That area is 200. It corresponds to consumer surplus that goes to bidder B. And so we get $200 of consumer surplus for bidder B. Total consumer surplus, let's call it consumer surplus total, would end up being, of course, $600. There's $600 of consumer surplus that's going to the people who bought guitars in this particular situation. So you can see that when the supply increase, it drives price down. And when it drives price down, that's going to increase consumer surplus. Now, consumer surplus, let's think about that for a second. Consumer surplus, this is going to be our measure of the well-being of buyers. If you think about why it works well as a measure of well-being, it's because the more consumer surplus you get, the better off you are, right? So if you think about when you go out to buy things, you almost always get some consumer surplus. You almost always pay a price that's below the maximum amount you would have been willing to pay. Sometimes there are, are times when you have a difficult time deciding whether or not to buy something. And maybe you think, okay, I'm going to buy this. And then you, you talk yourself out of it and you think, ah, oh, no, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to buy it. And then maybe you pick it back up again and say, okay, yeah, I, I am going to buy it. That's probably a time when the price that you're being asked to pay is, is pretty close to equal to your willingness to pay. And you have to decide, is it, is it, which is bigger? Is, am I willing to pay that price or am I not willing to pay that price? Most of the time that doesn't happen. You observe the price and you buy it. And you may not stop to think about the, the maximum amount you would have been willing to pay. And you probably don't stop to think about how much consumer surplus you're actually getting. But you are typically getting some consumer surplus. And the more consumer surplus you're getting, the better off you are. We call it consumer surplus because essentially it's surplus value that you didn't have to give up to get the good. So the, the more of that you get, the better off you are. So we're going to use consumer surplus as our measure of the well-being of buyers in the market. Okay. So now what I need to do is we need to clear this off and then we'll talk about what it looks like with just a regular demand curve because it's, it's actually much simpler when we switch to that type of demand curve. So let me clear this off and then we'll take a look at that. Okay, let's take a look at how this consumer surplus looks like with just a plain linear demand curve. So if we think about a demand curve like we're more comfortable working with, let me bring it up here to the vertical axis. So we've got P and Q, Q down here. So here's our demand curve. Um, let's suppose our price is right here. That's our equilibrium price. And here's the quantity transacted. Now, I'm leaving off the supply curve in this picture, but my supply curve would be going right up through that point. 
so I don't want it to get any more complicated than it needs to be. What we've just seen is that consumer surplus shows up as the area under the demand curve and above the price, so our consumer surplus would be this area right in here. Now when we've got a linear demand curve, consumer surplus is going to show up as a triangle. In my previous picture, it showed up as some rectangles. Um, here it's a triangle, but keep in mind, you still calculate the area of it, and that gives you consumer surplus. So if I had, let's suppose I, let me draw another example down here where I put some prices and a quantity on there. Let's suppose our price is 10, or excuse me, our intercept up here is 10. Let's suppose the price is 5, and the quantity over here, let's suppose it's 20. Okay. So we're looking for this area right here. And remember, anytime you've got a triangle like this, a triangle is half of a rectangle, right? So if you want the area of the triangle, you calculate the area of the rectangle and divide it by two. And the area of the rectangle would be the height, this distance, times the width, that distance. So our height here, consumer surplus, is equal to the height, which is five, multiplied by the width, which is 20, and then we have to divide by two, that's $50. So, consumer surplus is easy to calculate. Now let's take a break here for a second and think about why in our previous example, consumer surplus was equal to one number minus another number, and now all of a sudden it's showing up as an area. So if, if you're willing to pay $50 for something, and you only have to pay 10, you get $40 of consumer surplus. Well, what's going on here is that we're talking about multiple units of the good. Okay, so we're thinking about not just this first unit and how much consumer surplus you get, but then the next unit, the next unit, and the next unit, and the next unit. And by the time you add it up over all of these units, you're getting all of this area under the demand curve and above the supply or above the price. So if you're just talking about transaction of one unit, then it's just your willingness to pay minus the price. If we're talking about multiple units, like we would be with a market picture like that, then we're talking about an area, okay? Now, what we've just come up with, if we're talking about a demand curve, let's remember that we've just talked about the fact that that demand curve represents the value that consumers place on the good. And we know from our demand curve that looks like a set of steps that the consumers with the highest value are going to be represented up on this end of the demand curve. The consumers with the lowest value are going to be represented down on that end of the demand curve. With a linear demand curve like this, it's not as obvious exactly where each person is represented, but you can still keep in mind that it represents value. These people have a higher value than these people. Okay. So now let's think about how consumer surplus changes if we change price. Um, I'm going to draw another picture here. Here's a demand curve. Let's pick a price like P1. And let's identify our initial quantity here at Q1. And then let's think about what happens if price falls to P2. So what we want to think about here is what happens to consumer surplus if price goes down. Okay. So we can put Q2 out here. I'm going to label some areas. Let's call this area A. Let's call this uh, B. And let's call this C. Now let's start by thinking about consumer surplus at a price of P1. Consumer surplus at P1. Well, consumer surplus at a price of P1 is going to be the area under the demand curve and above the price, which is area A. Consumer surplus at our initial price of P1 is equal to area A. You would calculate that just to, by taking this height, multiplying by the width, dividing by 2. That would give you that area. Okay. Now let's think about what happens if price were to fall to P2. So price falls to P2. 
I'm leaving the supply curve off, but for price to be P1, our supply curve would be right there. And then if we have an increase in supply to right there, it would drive price down to P2. So I'm just not drawing those supply curves, but keep in mind they're there. So price falls to P2. What we saw in our previous picture when this, with the step demand curves was when that supply for guitars shifted to the right, then the price fell and what happened was consumer surplus increased and that's what we're going to see here. Consumer surplus at a price of P2 is now the area under the demand curve and above this price of P2 it's going to be area A plus B plus C. A plus B plus C. Now if you're calculating that you wouldn't calculate these three areas you just calculate the area of this bigger triangle right there. Okay. What we want to do is think about how much did consumer surplus change. So I'm going to talk about the change in consumer surplus. So how much did it go up by? Well, it started out at A, it went to A plus B plus C, so it increased by B and C. So the change in consumer surplus was B plus C. You could calculate that. If I asked you to calculate the change in consumer surplus, you could calculate it by calculating the area of this rectangle, height times width, you don't have to divide by 2, plus the area of this triangle, height times width divided by 2, or you could calculate the area of the small triangle, calculate the area of the big triangle, and subtract the smaller one from the bigger one. That would give you that area. Okay. Let's talk about these two chunks right here, B and C. So let's start by thinking about what happens when our supply curve increases. Well, when the supply curve increases, it drives price down, consumer surplus goes up by that amount, B plus C. But let's think about where this consumer surplus B, where that ends up going, and where C goes. So if you think about the consumers that are buying the good, the consumers that are buying the good are going to be represented along this portion of the demand curve at a price of P1. At a price of P1, these consumers are buying the good. And when the price falls to P2, those consumers continue to buy the good and they're made even better off because they get more consumer surplus. They bought at the higher price of P1, they're definitely going to buy at a price of P2. And so area B represents more consumer surplus that goes to the original buyers. So area B, this is the increase in consumer surplus to the original buyers. Those were the buyers who bought at the higher price of P1. When the price goes down to P2, notice that that brings some additional buyers into the market. These people represented along this portion of the demand curve. From that point to that point, these people, those people enter the market when price goes down. Just like in our previous picture with the step demand curve, when there were two guitars, bidder B entered the market. Now we use that term entered the market. They were there all along, but at a price of P1, these people down here don't buy any of the good. Once the price falls to P2, these people all of a sudden decide to buy the good, just like Bitter B decided to buy a guitar once the price fell to 600. So area C represents the consumer surplus that goes to the new entrance into the market. See, this is consumer surplus to, I'm going to put in, in quotes here, the new entrance into the market. These were people who didn't buy at a price of P1, but now decide to buy at a price of P2 because their willingness to pay is now higher than the price. Okay. So you can see that the total amount of the additional consumer surplus can be broken up into different groups. If we were to reverse this, if we were to start with a low price, a supply curve out here, and have our supply curve shift to the left, that would drive price up. These people would leave the market. They would switch from being buyers to being non-buyers. They wouldn't buy the good. 
we would lose some consumer surplus. These people up here would continue to buy the good even at the higher price because their willingness to pay is still greater than the price, but they would lose this chunk of consumer surplus, area B, but they'd still continue to buy. What I need to do now is clear this off and then we'll talk about producer surplus. Let's talk now about developing a measure of the well-being of the sellers in a market. So we're going to develop something that we're going to call producer surplus. And in a lot of ways it's going to be very similar to consumer surplus, only obviously we'll be talking about the other side of the market. So let's, let's kind of do the same thing. Let's, let's think about now, instead of selling this guitar, let's suppose that you're going to get bids to have a guitar built for you. Okay, so let's suppose that, that you get um, some shops to bid on building you a guitar. So let's have um, shops, let's call them E, F, G, and H. Okay. And let's think about their cost of production. So this is going to be the cost of production for each of the shops. All of them are going to build an identical guitar. Let's suppose you've got the plans for it. You've got, uh, maybe you've got the woods picked out. You know exactly what the hardware is going to look like. And so they're going to build the exact same guitar, but they're all going to have different cost of production. Let's suppose Shop E, their cost of production is $200. For them to build the guitar, it costs them $200. These are not the prices they're going to charge you. This is their cost of production. So don't think about that's, that as being the cost to you. Okay. Let's suppose shop F has a cost of production of 400, G 600, and H 800. And you might ask, well, if they're all building the same guitar, then why would they have different opportunity costs? Well, because everybody has a different opportunity cost of their time, and so it, even though the good is identical, they can have different opportunity costs. So if we think about what's going to happen in this situation, it's kind of a reverse auction. You're going to start the price high and you're going to say, okay, who will build the guitar for $1,000? And of course, all of them would be willing to build the guitar for $1,000. And then you're going to say, okay, who would build it for $900? And all of them would be willing to bid it, build it for $900. And as the price falls, as soon as the price fell just below 800, shop H would say, okay, we're out. We're not going to, we can't do it for that. Price would continue to fall because E, F, and G would bid against each other. So the price continues to fall until it's just below 600. And then D drops out. Price continues to fall until it's just below 400. And then F drops out. So we know that shop E will end up building the guitar and they're going to charge one bidding increment less than 400. Let's just for convenience call it 400. So Shop E builds the guitar. And they charge you $400. Remember, you don't see that number. Right? They don't show up to the auction and tell you what their cost of production is going to be. The auction process revealed the cost of production for H, G, and F, but not for E. So Shop E builds a guitar, charges you $400. We would say that they get $200 of producer surplus. They're going to get $400. It's going to cost them $200, so they're going to get to keep $200, okay? So we say that Shop E, oops, Shop E gets $200 of producer surplus, which we're going to abbreviate PS, producer surplus. Here's the definition that we're using, producer surplus is equal to the price minus the cost of production. Producer surplus is equal to price minus cost of production. So the price here was 400 minus their cost of production of 200. That leaves them with producer surplus of $200. Okay. Now, at this point, 
you may be looking at that and saying, hmm, that sounds a lot like profit. Well, turns out that it's producer surplus and profit are not the same thing. But for what we're doing right here, if you were to think about it, while it wouldn't be technically correct, and it would be okay to think about that at this point that way. Let's draw the supply curve for guitars. Now, we could put together the supply schedule. I'm going to kind of skip that since we did that for the demand situation. Let's just, we can just use this information. We know what's going to end up happening. Let's put our prices here. 200, 400, 600, and 800. Our quantities go up to four because there's four shops. If we think about, let's start with low prices. It's easier in this case to start down here. So if we start with low prices like $100, no shop is willing to build it for $100. So any price up to $200, our supply curve would be this portion of the vertical axis. And at a price of $200, shop E is willing to build the guitar. So our quantity supply jumps to one unit at that price. Any price between 200 and 400, it's still just shop E. So we get a vertical segment. At 400, it jumps to two because now shop F is also willing to build it. Any price between 400 and 600, it stays at two. At 600, it jumps to three. Any price between 600 and 800, it stays at three. And then at 800, it jumps to four and any price above 800, all four of them are willing to build the guitar. So we get a supply curve that looks like that. And it's, the key is that it's upward sloping. It looks like a set of steps, but again, that's because we're thinking about discrete units of the good. And we've got a small number of firms here. But the nice thing about this supply curve is it helps us understand first off, that the supply curve is representing the cost of production here. So I'm going to label this supply curve as representing the cost of production because if you look at the height of the supply curve right here, the height is representing shop E's cost of production. I'll, I'll abbreviate it COP, cost of production. Right here, the height of the supply curve is representing shop F's cost of production. And right here, this is G's cost of production. And right here is H's cost of production. So the height of the supply curve at every point is representing the cost of production. Okay. Now let's think about what the demand curve looks like in this case. So the demand curve, we only want one guitar produced. And so the demand curve is perfectly inelastic at a price of one. So I could draw it in there, but I'm not going to. We know that what's going to end up happening is our equilibrium quantity is one. The equilibrium price is going to end up being 400 because of the nature of this auction. And this area right here, this represents the producer surplus that goes to shop E. I'm going to call it producer surplus with a little E down there. If you calculate the area of that little rectangle, this vertical distance is 200, horizontal distance is one. So the area here is 200, which is exactly what we got when we calculated it down here. It was 400 minus 200 producer surplus was equal to $200. Okay. We could do the same thing if we wanted. With our demand curve, we could suppose that we want two identical guitars to be built. And let's suppose each shop can only build one. Then if we shifted the demand curve to the right, we know that an increase in demand is going to drive price up and quantity up. So if our demand curve shifted to the right, then it's going to drive quantity up to two. It's going to drive price up to $600 each. Shop E would still produce a guitar and get paid $600. So they would get $400 of consumer surplus, or excuse me, producer surplus. And shop F would now build a guitar. They'd sell it for $600. It would cost them $400 to produce. They would get $200 of producer surplus. We could look at the total amount of producer surplus as all of the area under the uh, price and above the supply curve. 
So everything works the same as what we saw with demand. It's just now that we're talking about supply, we're talking about the area under the price and above the supply curve. So if we were to switch now to just a plain upward sloping supply curve, if here's our price, then we can go over here. Here would be the quantity. I'm going to leave the demand curve off. It would be going down through there. But what we've just seen is that producer surplus is the area under the price and above the supply curve. Okay, there's producer surplus. Make sure we label that supply curve. What we want to do now is just think about what happens if price changes. And let's go with our linear supply curve. So let me draw another picture here. And we'll do something similar to what we did with demand. Let's draw a supply curve. Let's start with a price of P1. Okay. Let's look at a quantity of Q1. And then we'll think about what happens if price goes up to P2. We'll think about a quantity of Q2. I'm going to put a little dash line there. We call this A. Let's call this B. Let's call that C. And I'll go through this fairly quickly. Let's start with producer surplus at a price of P1. Producer surplus at a price of P1 is the area under the price and above the supply curve. It's area A. Producer surplus at a price of P2. Now our price is up here. Producer surplus is all the area under the price and above the supply curve, so it's going to be B plus C. Let's say A plus B plus C. When the price goes up, that increases producer surplus. So the change in producer surplus, how much did it change by? Well, that's area B plus C. And we can break that up area up into two chunks, just like we did with demand. So the sellers that sell the good at a price of P1 are these sellers represented along this portion of the supply curve from that point to that point. At a price of P1, there are our sellers. Just like at a price of 400, there is our seller. It's shop E. When the price rises to P2, shop E still sells the good and it gets more producer surplus. So area B, that represents increase in producer surplus to the original sellers. Increase in producer surplus to the original sellers. Okay. Just like when demand increases and price goes up, Shop E continues to sell the good, sell the guitar, and they make more producer surplus. But what also happens is when that price goes up, Shop F entered the market. And so when the price rises to P2, these sellers right here enter the market. Now they were there all along on our picture. It's just that they weren't selling the good at a price of P1. So area C is producer surplus to the, what we're going to call new entrance into the market. Okay. So now let's think about what we've got. We've talked about consumer surplus. It's going to be our measure of the well-being of buyers. We've talked about producer surplus. It's going to be our measure of the well-being of sellers. Keep in mind that the units of measure that we're using for all of these, these are dollars. So the nice thing about consumer surplus and producer surplus is that the units of measure are something that we're really comfortable thinking about. Okay? Unlike Jeremy Bentham's original idea where we had utility and it was measured in utils, I don't know what a util is, but I know what a dollar is and I know what a dollar can buy. And so these are really useful ways of measuring well-being. What we want to do now is take these ways of measuring well-being and think about how a market works and whether or not a market works in a way that, that increases human well-being. Okay, So I'm going to do that in the next video. We'll also see that we can come back 
and use these to kind of think about how public policy, different types of government policy, impact consumer and producer surplus. So we'll do that in a future video.